Welcome to this four-part family and patient education series on eating disorders. My name is Dr. Bertrand Wickelis, and I'm a psychiatrist at BC Children's Hospital uh, in the Eating Disorder Program. Today, I will be discussing various psychological issues related to eating disorders, and I'll also be discussing the uh, treatment and recovery process. I think it's helpful for parents to know that eating disorders are serious medical illnesses. They aren't a choice. No teenager is choosing to have an eating disorder and it's certainly not a lifestyle choice or just teenage rebellion. It's a serious illness just like cancer or diabetes or asthma. I think it's very important for parents to understand this for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, if they really understand that this is a illness, they're more likely to take it seriously and to get treatment as fast as possible. Um, research shows that the sooner a person gets treatment for an eating disorder, the better the, the outcome or the prognosis. So that's a very important point for parents to realize. Um, a couple other reasons why it's important not to think of this as a choice or a lifestyle. Um, one is um, when people view an eating disorder like a choice, they're more likely to convey blame and criticism. And research shows that the more judgmental or critical parents are of their, of their children, the more difficult it is for them to recover from an eating disorder. It's also very important for parents not to blame themselves um, because the more a parent blames themselves, that just makes the child feel more guilty about the burden that they're causing and the trouble that they're causing their parents by having this disorder. And, um, and so this type of guilt that the child feels can, can just feed the eating disorder thoughts. Uh, so I think it's very important that parents realize that this is a serious medical illness and we don't actually know the cause of eating disorders. Uh, oftentimes parents think to themselves, well, if we could just figure out the cause, we can solve this. And so fortunately, uh, recovery just doesn't work that way. Um, even if you think that you've found the cause of the eating disorder, there's really no way to prove it. Uh, so really the way we focus on um, recovery here at Children's Hospital is by not focusing or trying to find some underlying cause, but really focusing on how do we support this child or adolescent to recover from the eating disorder and what are the obstacles that are getting in the way of recovery and to try to remove those obstacles. I think parents play a very important role in the treatment of their child um, and their recovery from the eating disorder. I think in the past there's been two misconceptions about um, eating disorder treatment. One misconception has to do with the role of the parent and the other one has to do with the role of talking about food and eating and treatment. Uh, so let's talk about the role of the parents. It used to be believed that in order to recover from um, an eating disorder, the adolescent actually had to be separated uh, from the parents. And this was um, referred to as a parentectomy. Um, and, but I think what research and what clinical evidence has shown that this actually is not very helpful. In fact, it's quite hurtful to, to the patient and the family. Um, I think now the philosophy of most treatment programs, as, and certainly the philosophy here at Children's Hospital, is that um, the parents play a very important role in treatment. They know their child best and they love their child best. So we make every effort to, to have the parents involved um, in all aspects of um, the recovery and treatment here at Children's Hospital. Uh, secondly, I think there's some misconception about um, the role of talking about food and eating and treatment. I think there's some clinicians who might believe that um, you shouldn't be talking about food and eating because this is just going to lead to unhelpful power and control struggles. Um, I think this sort of is based on the assumption that if you can just solve the underlying cause or, or solve the underlying emotional problems, well then the eating um, will sort of resolve on its own without having to address that. Um, I think this is also a false assumption. Um, I think that uh, most people now understand that really 
helping the child to relearn how to eat normally and to regain the weight that they've lost is absolutely critical to treatment. Uh, when somebody is in a state of starvation, their brain is not functioning properly. You can't do effective uh, therapy when, some, when the brain is starving and a person's not able to think clearly. Uh, so you can do as much psychotherapy as you want with a starving brain, it's probably not going to be very effective. Um, that's not to say that you know, there should be no psychotherapy when somebody's underweight. There can still be a helpful role for psychotherapy, but clearly I think the first priority is to get, regain and restore physical health, which means weight restoration. And I think this is a key point that I think both families and patients need to understand, is that physical recovery precedes psychological recovery. As long as somebody is in a state of starvation, um, they're not going to be able to fully recover from an eating disorder. Eating disorder thoughts and feelings don't go away unless a person is able to achieve a healthy weight. So putting these two concepts together, um, it's very important that parents are involved um, in treatment and that the treatment then focuses on helping the child to restore their physical health and their weight. And um, one of the uh, forms of therapy that's probably most empirically um, supported by research is something called family-based therapy or Maudsley family therapy. And what this therapy does is it helps um, empower parents to really take charge of their kids eating, to be in charge of getting their child to retrain their body and their mind to eat regularly every day. Um, and the way family therapy, uh, family-based therapy looks at an eating disorder symptoms is that if a child is not able to eat, they're really out of control. It's the eating disorder that's in control here and that it requires somebody else to take charge of the eating. Um, and that's the parent's role. And so the treatment of family-based therapy is really helping the parents learn how to support their child uh, to, to eat the food that they need to recover from their eating disorder. If a child refuses to eat, there's no simple uh, one-size-fit-all answer for all parents. I wish there was, but there isn't. Instead, I think maybe a more helpful question to ask is how can parents create a culture at home where 100% completion of all meals and snacks is considered absolutely necessary and required? Or another way to think about it is how can parents create a culture at home where it becomes basically impossible for the child not to complete? There's three general guidelines that I'd like to recommend to parents in terms of how to create this culture of 100% completion. The first uh, guideline is parental unity. I think this is really a critical point, that parents need to be 100% unified in all aspects of the refeeding process. This means that parents need to uh, agree in advance what foods their child is going to eat at each meal and snack and how much they're going to eat. If the parents are in any way in disagreement on these critical issues, the eating disorder is going to sense the disagreement and it's going to sneak through that little wedge that's been created between both parents and it's going to find a way to um, take control of the meal. The best way to prevent the eating disorder from feeling disempowered at the meal is for both parents to be 100% uh, together and unified in deciding how much their child is going to eat. Now, eating disorders are very tricky and sneaky illnesses. They have an excellent ability to pick up on any doubt in their, in their parents. So if one parent is doubting himself or herself feeling, uh-oh, I think I'm giving my kid too much food, the eating disorder is going to pick up on that and that's going to make it very difficult uh, for the child to complete the meal. The second guideline I like to share with parents is the importance of planning and organization of meals and snacks. I can't overemphasize the importance of planning given the, the busyness of people's lives today. Um, probably one of the best ways to guarantee that a meal or snack is not going to go well is to be in a hurry and to scramble the last minute trying to decide what am I going to feed my child for dinner. Because what this tends to do is increase the child's anxiety leading to more debates and conflict. Um, people with eating disorders really struggle with uncertainty and they struggle with surprises. They like to know in advance what are they going to have to eat. This helps reduce their anxiety so that when they're at the meal, um, it makes it a lot easier for them to eat. The way we deal with this in the inpatient program is that um, we have a menu group once a week where the patients go over their menus and they see exactly what they're going to have for all of their meals and snacks for the entire week. So when it comes to meal time, there's no debate 
There's no discussion. Uh, the expectation is, is that you've already, you already know what you're going to eat. You've already had an opportunity to make a few limited choices. And then your job is simply to eat. This really helps reduce their anxiety, uh, which makes it much easier for them to complete their meals. The third guideline I like to share with parents is the importance of consistent consequences when the child does not complete a meal or snack. If a child is not completing a meal, this means that they're not giving their body the fuel it needs. Fuel in must match fuel out. Just as if you're driving a car on empty, eventually the car is going to break down. It's the same thing with the human body. If a child is not completing a meal or snack, they must rest and not be engaged in physical activity um, that would actually that would go on to burn uh, more calories. In our inpatient program, when somebody does not complete a meal, the consequence is, is that they need to go to their room and rest. Now, this isn't meant to be punishment, and it's not meant to be cruel or anything like that. They can still play games, watch a video, uh, do something um, fun um, with you know with a staff member or with their family. Um, but the point is, is they've got to conserve their energy. If somebody is not completing their meals at home, it does not make sense to let them go for a walk, walk the dog, or go to soccer practice. Um, instead, really what has to happen is that they need to stay home and they need to conserve their energy and rest until they um, are able to complete at the next meal or snack. The fourth guideline I like to share with parents is a simple one, persistence. The parents simply have to be more persistent than the eating disorder. They have to be so unrelenting in their efforts at every meal and snack, requiring their child to eat it, implementing the consistent consequences for non-completion after every meal and snack that the child simply says to themselves, you know what, this isn't worth it. Food restriction, it's too much of a pain. It's easier just to eat the food because my parents aren't gonna give up. Parents just need to be so relentless that it, they're really, what they're doing is creating a culture that it becomes impossible not to complete. In summary, I think that if parents are able to remember these four guidelines, that they can successfully create a culture at home where their child is required to complete 100% of all meals and snacks. The first guideline, again, is parents being 100% unified in their approach to refeeding. The second guideline is for parents to be organized and to plan all meals in advance. The third guideline is for parents to institute clear and consistent consequences of rest and no physical activity for non-completion of meals. And the fourth guideline is simply for parents to be more persistent and consistent than the eating disorder. One of the best ways for parents to help their child with the eating disorder recovery is to help them with the eating. I think it's important for re parents to realize that in the early stages of recovery, their child simply is not able to recover alone. Recovery from an eating disorder requires an enormous amount of support and structure around eating. This means that parents need to be involved in every aspect of their child's eating, from selecting what foods they're going to eat, preparing the food, and serving the food, and um, supervising and making sure that their child eats 100%. Um, I typically recommend to parents that they are going to have to be incredibly involved in meal support and supervision for at least a year after, the, after treatment begins. This is a huge time commitment for parents, but I think they need to realize that after a few months, most likely their child is not going to be ready or able uh, to eat on their own. That they will need their ongoing support from the parents to make sure that their child is completing 100%. There's a few guidelines that I like to give parents, which I call the three C's of, of communication. Uh, the first C is stay calm, is when your child is having a hard time and struggling. It's so important for parents to stay calm and not to get too emotional themselves. Um, the more parents show negative emotions, things like anxiety, fear, and anger, those emotions are contagious and they only increase the child's negative emotions and anxiety. The second uh, C is confident. It's so important for parents not to doubt themselves. Their child is going to be looking for them to them for reassurance. Is it okay for me to eat this? Um, am I gaining weight too fast? If the parents ha are having any doubt about these issues, the child's going to pick up on it. So the parents really need to be confident that they're doing the right thing by requiring their child to eat 100% of all meals and snacks. 
The third C stands for compassion. And this is a very simple one. Remaining warm, understanding, positive, but firm at the same time. One of the ways I like to teach parents about the three C's is to ask them to think back to when they taught their child how to swim or ride a bike. For them to remember how scared and anxious their child was when they were first learning this new skill. Back then, um, there was no debates, arguments, um, or long discussions about the pros and cons of riding a bike. Instead, you just offered very simple, positive encouragement. You can do this. You know, one step further. I know you can do this. Let's go. Let's keep trying. If you don't get it today, we'll do it tomorrow. What I encourage parents is to use the same basic, positive, um, calm, compassionate approach uh, to eating. Uh, not to get into big arguments and debates, just to keep it simple and positive. I know you can eat this. Let's keep trying. Uh, let's just take one more bite. One of the great things about working in this field is I get to work with families who never cease to inspire me in their efforts uh, to help their child recover from an eating disorder. I'm constantly amazed at how parents um, can be, show such strength and uh, courage and determination in helping their child recover. From my experience, I've noticed that uh, families that do particularly well with recovery have a sort of a, a few similar approaches to the recovery process. The first approach is that um, they view recovery not as an endpoint but as a process. It's a journey. I think this is difficult for parents to grasp sometimes because they're so afraid about uh, something bad happening to their child or their child dying from the illness. But I think it's really important to remember that it's not where you end up that matters most but how you get there. So thinking back to the example of teaching your child how to ride a bike it's not the skill of riding a bike that really matters in the long run. It's all the lessons about life and family that your child learns in the process of learning how to ride a bike. So those lessons are, is it okay for me to fall? Will my parents help me stand back up? Will they judge me or not love me if I'm not as good at this as they want me to be? These are the important lessons. So I think it's the same way with an eating disorder. You have to think about the process of recovery and it's not just where you end up in the long run, but how you get there. The second approach is to view all mistakes as learning opportunities. This is key because there is no road map to recovery. There's no right way to recover from an eating disorder. Every patient and family has to discover their own path towards recovery. And from my experience, this path tends to be a windy one. Typically, it's three steps forwards and two steps back. So it's important to realize that recovery is a trial and error process and that in that process you can learn a lot of important lessons. It teaches you that it's okay not to be perfect, that you learn more from your failures than you learn from your successes, and that if you don't get something the first time, you keep on trying. These are incredibly important lessons for somebody with an eating disorder to learn because people with eating disorders have a tremendous fear of failure. My patients often tell me that they don't want to try something new unless they're absolutely guaranteed that they will be successful or perfect at it the first time. But I think we all know that this just isn't realistic in the adult world. The third approach is for parents to be open and curious about change in themselves. I think it's important to realize that the patient is not the only person who changes through the recovery process. We all change. I, as a psychiatrist, am constantly changing how I think about eating disorders, treatment and recovery based on my experiences with my clients. And parents need to realize that they're going to change too. In fact, the whole family is going to change. Recovery doesn't mean going back in time and for everybody to be the same person they were before the illness started. Recovery just doesn't work that way. Instead, I think parents need to realize that this is an opportunity for everybody to learn and grow and to reflect on who they are and how be they became the people they are. I have noticed that the parents who are able to be open and embrace this change and reflection in themselves are the ones who are best able to cope with all the ups and downs of the recovery process. Approach number four is for parents to practice good self-care. This means not allowing the eating disorder to completely dominate the family's life, but for parents to take good care of themselves and to model for their children that it's okay to have fun, it's okay to relax, and it's okay to engage in small indulgences like getting a massage, 
watching TV, or getting a manicure. I think for eating disorder patients, this is particularly important because having an eating disorder is kind of like having a prison guard in your own brain. That prison guard is constantly telling your child that you have to work harder, that you don't deserve fun, uh, and that you're bad, and that you have to work to become a better person. And so the more that parents are able to model for their child having fun and relaxing, the easier it is going to be for the child to disobey the prison guard and to have fun. It's important that parents realize that recovery from an eating disorder is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It takes time. Research shows that it takes five to seven years for an adolescent to recover from an eating disorder. So it's so important that parents don't burn out and they take good care of themselves so that they're able to be there for their child through the long run. In conclusion, I want to emphasize just how important the role of parents are in the treatment and recovery of their child's eating disorder. I also want to end on a message of hope. Even though eating disorders are very serious illnesses, they're also highly treatable illnesses. In fact, research shows that the vast majority of adolescents fully recover from their eating disorder. So when parents ask me, once somebody has an eating disorder, does that mean that they will always struggle with eating and have an eating disorder? And my answer is invariably no. Here at Children's Hospital, we have the privilege of watching children and adolescents recover from eating disorders all of the time. That's part of what makes this job so rewarding. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope that the information presented today was helpful to you, and I wish you the very best in your journey towards recovery.